again, it's that point of, it's not that you can't, it's just that you could and you could do it better. And especially, you know, you have your two-year-old, young horses are, are really like a, a bread and butter when it comes to this, because again, we don't realize how much faster they can learn when we are capable of getting in and out of their way when needed and doing it efficiently, not doing it, oh, oops, I was a little late, eh, whatever. You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Welcome to The Ride, a bi-weekly podcast brought to you by Horse and Rider Magazine. I'm your host, Nicole Cherico. In each episode, I chat with some of the industry's top trainers, clinicians, horsekeeping experts, and professionals to share inspiring stories, training philosophies, and the importance of living your best Western horse life. In this week's episode, I sit down to talk with Kelly Altschweger. Kelly is an ACE certified personal trainer, nutrition coach, and performance and rider fitness specialist based out of Wellington, Colorado. After years in the performance horse world and fitness industry, she noticed a reoccurring trend. The majority of horse owners and competitors were investing incredible amounts of time and money on their horses' training, feed, tack, and overall well being. But they weren't doing the same for themselves. Her company, Western Workouts, is built on a framework of proven strategies and personalized solution creation designed to support individual objectives in and out of the saddle. Now she works with riders on an international level to help them reach their riding and fitness goals. Please enjoy this week's episode brought to you by ManaPro. So Kelly, why don't you go ahead and explain what it is that you do for those who might not be as familiar with you? Fantastic. Absolutely. So what I do is create not only attainable, but also sustainable fitness and nutrition strategies for those in the Western and equestrian lifestyle. Um, We all know that our lives tend to be busier. There's a lot of travel. There's a lot of non-negotiables like feeding our horses, chores, riding, things that, you know, other people might not have to deal with or have that time taken from them. Uh, you know, in other lifestyles. So ensuring that we are creating very individualized and sustainable programs and strategies for each person I work with regarding their goals, whether that be body fat loss, muscle growth, improved performance. Sometimes it's even just improving one's relationship with food and exercise. Um, I always include a bit of mindset coaching in with everything I do because at the end of the day, let's be real, like convincing ourselves and believing in ourselves and getting rid of that negative voice in our head can be one of the most challenging things. So everything I do is very individualized to each client I have. There are no cookie cutter programs. There are no cookie cutter meal plans or ways of eating. It's all created to each person and they have end of day goals to meet however they meet that. So they can ensure that what they're doing fits them, their needs, their lifestyle, and also fits what they need to do to reach their goals. And so the last time we had you on the podcast, this was before I actually work with you now. And this was, we had had you on the podcast before I started working with you personally. You, I met you through the magazine. I loved what you are doing for the industry. And, um, yeah, I, I can honestly say that it has totally changed the way that I look at riding. And, um, the reason that I even got in touch with you personally was because I was starting to ride and show again. And then I got a two-year-old now and, and, you know, you forget how strong you have to be when you're, you know, getting ready to do these kinds of things. And and it was a life changing thing. And now all I can think about is like how many years I probably could have been better if I focused on that aspect of showing because it's so easy to get caught up in my horse needs injections, yeah. my horse needs a chiropractor, my horse needs a dentist, like, but then we forget about, you know, us yeah. and then we're going around lame yeah. and you know, this and that, and you're just not fueling your body, which is something that you love to say. <laughs> and that's, that's so true. And I, I think, you know, it's, we get really laser focused on what my horse needs and what my horse needs. And oftentimes I think because the majority of people are capable riders and it's not about, I say this all the time, Western workouts and my coaching is not about someone not already being a capable capable rider. It is about improving on any and every area possible, not just for you, but for respect of your horse. You know, we really ask them to show up for us in so many ways. When we're riding, even just on a day-to-day basis, we ask so much of them. 
And because we're capable, it's easy to put ourselves on the back burner. Like, oh, I can ride. Oh, I'm pretty sticky in case that young horse gets a little goosey. Oh, I, I can do this. But we forget that we all have imbalances. We have strengths, weaknesses, things that we might be babying or babysitting when we're in the saddle that if we spent, you know, 20, 30 minutes a day on ourselves that we could improve upon. So when we get in the saddle, it's already fixed. It's already been addressed. That second nature of improved movement patterns already exists. So we can really be a more present and capable rider for our horse. You know, I say it all the time. A lot of, a lot of times, you know, we can do one thing and then we kind of get stuck in another, you know, we can sit up with a good posture, but then our hips get a little stuck or because they're tight or we haven't focused on them. Or let's say we have really good flexible and mobile hips, but our trunk stability is really weak. So we tend to slouch or lean forward more when we could be sitting upright and driving forward. So it really comes down to, again, not looking at ourselves as incapable, but looking at ourselves as wanting more for ourselves and our horse in a really positive way. You really changed my outlook um, in riding and fitness to, uh, so Kelly comes from the reining industry, which if you've listened to the other podcasts, we've gone into depth with that. But uh, when I started doing cow horse and reining, obviously my body has to change the way that I ride compared to when I was doing the horsemanship, the equitation, the showmanship, all that stuff. And you really opened my eyes with um, mobility and strength and flexibility. And especially when it comes to sliding stops or spins and staying balanced in the saddle. And, and that was all stuff that I've always taken, you know, advantage of and just never was like, oh, I need to strengthen my core so that I'm sitting, you know, tighter in the saddle when I'm spinning or, you know, I'm not you know, sitting on one side or the other, but yeah, you totally changed my outlook on all that. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Cause I, I mean, I think the world of you, and I know you are an incredibly capable rider as is, you know, again, it's that point of, it's not that you can't, it's just that you couldn't, you could do it better. And especially, you know, you have your two-year-old young horses are, are really like a, a bread and butter when it comes to this, because again, we don't realize how much faster they can learn when we are capable of getting in and out of their way when needed and doing it efficiently, not doing it. Oh, oops, I was a little late. Yeah, whatever. You know, when you are physically able, and, and that's another thing that I love about adding, you know, fitness to the routine of a horseman is you gain instead of, you know, more so than just strength or improved balance and mobility, you're gaining spatial awareness, you're gaining improved body control, you're gaining improved mind muscle connection so you are really able to fine tune your movement and your timing, not just for your sake, but for your horses. And it's incredible. I say it all the time. Like this, this job is totally like a, a selfish win on my part because I love seeing people succeed. I love seeing people happy and confident and feel good. But beyond any other, you know, fitness coach, I also get to see their horses improve. And that is like icing on the cake for me, where you get to see that team of rider and horse get even better and better together. And it's it's such a, a huge, just fill my cup. Like I l absolutely love it. So um, I, I love hearing those success stories. And, you know, as you know, riding different horses, you know, it can, it's like driving your own car for so long and then getting in someone else's and being like, oh, my brakes maybe need checked because it can feel like this. You know, when we go from riding horse to horse, and some horses are really physical movers and you have to like, you have to work to keep up with them versus that horse that just lopes along real nice. And you just, they kind of just stay right in place. You know, when you're physically strong and I really approach fitness, you know, instead of just muscle splits, kind of the traditional conventional way of lifting and strength training, focusing on chains, you know, as a rider, you're never just using one muscle group at a time. You are using your entire posterior chain, you know, from your back to your low back, to your glutes, to your hamstrings, to your calves and your heels. Like that's all working together. Your trunk is also working like with, you know, your shoulder muscles and, and your back to stay upright or forward. So I, I really have brought in quite a bit of new lifts and exercises that truly specifically target the rider and what's needed of them when they're in the saddle. So we're gaining all of that. Again, once you hop on all these different horses, like your body is prepared for whatever each individual horse might present you with. 
Well, and I think kind of going off of that, the different disciplines really, you showcase what your strengths and weaknesses are. When I was doing the horsemanship at that slower speed, you know, my core was really tight. I could stay centered in the saddle, but when I'm asking my reiner to do a fast circle, I'm finding myself out of breath. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, like I know I'm physically fit, but like, where can I adjust what I'm doing to make it easier? Because if I'm out of breath, then I'm out of sync with my horse. I'm, you know, not kicking as well as I probably, or using my leg as well as I probably could because I'm too busy trying to like keep the forward motion going. Like it's just really fascinating that 20 years I could go and like everybody, you know, your core is tight and you're centered and this and that. And then I go and do a new event and I'm like, wow, I'm doing something wrong. Right. Well, and that's, that's such a a great point you touch on is the different, um, kind of physical requirements, discipline to discipline. And, and that's something that I've really enjoyed again with the individualization of what I do is getting to know each person and the things they compete in. I've, there's been kind of an influx of people, um, in like the reigning cow horse world, taking this step into like the jumping world a lot of these clients I have are are interchanging the English Western disciplines and it's been really fun to work with them and get firsthand feedback on like, okay, when I'm doing this, I feel great. But then I hop in this saddle and I go do this and I'm like, whole new world. Now what? You know, and it's, it's so fun to really create those fine tuned programs for each person. So when they, you know, they hop on, it's like, oh, I've got this here I am. Because there are a lot of different, you know, muscle requirements that don't, you know, there's plenty that are all identical. Like, yes, trunk stability is going to be helpful straight across the board. But there are so many little intricacies that are really, really fun to, um, you know, work with and on rider to rider. Yeah. So, uh, on this particular episode, I wanted to bring Kelly back because while we had a really great conversation learning about her horse life and her career and, and how she ended up doing Western workouts, I really wanted to make this a podcast episode where Kelly could provide insights on what you can do to help get you through the winter. I know personally, Kelly and I are both in Colorado. We get stuck with wind. We get stuck with snow. Kelly is in an outdoor arena only. I have a very tiny indoor, so we're all very limited with what we can do. But, um, if you want to, you know, get into the spring and summer months and not have to worry about playing catch up, there's a lot of things that you can continue to do in the winter months, even if you don't have that big pasture or the grassy area to go ride on. So, um, jumping into that a little bit, uh, Kelly, why don't we go ahead and just talk a little bit about the importance of staying in shape all year when it comes to riding and, and how that can help you Absolutely. and your horse. So ultimately I, I tell everyone it is better to stay caught up and use your time to stay caught up than having to play catch up on the back end. Cause it's always going to take more time having to catch back up. So when your riding might be limited, depending on, like you said, I'm in an outdoor. Last March when we had that blizzard that came through, I had snow drifts that covered the top of my pens. My arena was, I mean, a five foot snow drift and then a pond uh, for a while. So in those times, I, I really like to encourage people, like think of it as, yes, it can be frustrating not getting to ride as often, but think of it as an advantage to focus on you really make it your selfish time. So when you get back to riding more consistently or more often, you're already set and prepared. Whether your horse is fresh, maybe they're not fresh at all, but you are prepared for everything that's going to be asked of you as you increase your ride time. Instead of having to catch up and now you're fighting soreness, you're going to have leg soreness, you might have hip or low back soreness, you might have knee pain from getting back in the saddle and back to riding more often. So taking that off quote unquote, off season time, if you will, to focus on you, focus on what are the aches and pains I have that are more so than just day-to-day life. I think a lot of us, we tend to learn to live with the aches and pains because they're just kind of, they're kind of, they come with the territory, right? But it's those small little monotonous things you can do, the stretching, the strengthening of certain muscle groups that can really reduce and often eliminate all of those aches and pains. So now you're going back to your horse in the spring or whatever time you might, and you are on top of your game. You've eliminated aches and pains. You have strengthened the weaknesses you had prior. 
and you are more prepared. And it really, it's a, it's kind of a blessing in disguise sometimes if you're willing to take that time out of the saddle to focus on your needs. Well, and it kind of goes back to, you know, what we were talking about a little earlier that you're going to be more efficient riding that horse when it comes springtime. So yeah, you might not be able to lope laps in your arena because it's <laughs> snow drifts. Um, but you know, it's going to, your horse is going to get in much better shape, much faster because you are yeah. where you need. And to again, be. like a combating muscle soreness, you know, when you haven't ridden for a while and you hop back in the saddle and then you're like, I am so sore. It's either going to be really hard to ride the next few days and you're going to be a, a you know, a, an imbalanced mess just trying to hang on with sore muscles and you're going to survive instead of thrive, or you're going to be so sore, you might not ride for a few more days again. And the same actually applies to exercise and strength training. You know, if you're not taking the little bits of time to stay caught up and you go a lengthened amount of time without doing anything and you go back into it and you're so sore, there's just no chance you could work that muscle group or even your entire body for multiple days in a row, you're actually doing yourself a disservice. If you can stay ahead of it and so, okay, you're a little sore, but you can go ride. Not a big deal versus I'm so sore. I'm just going to be a rag doll up on top of my horse. They're not going to get anything out of it. I'm not going to be able to cue effectively. We're just going to survive this ride. That's not really worthwhile either. Right. Um, and then another thing, cause you had talked a little bit about the mindset. I think in the winter months we run into a really tough mindset, whether it's, um, you know, it's too cold, it's too windy. It's the holidays are getting, you know, the holidays mess up your routine. Um, what's your advice to riders as they come into the winter months and, and, you know, life gets crazy for a lot of people this time of year. How do they keep that mindset that where it needs to be? Question. So I think there's a few strategies you can use. Um, one that I really encourage everyone to do is clearly define your why, not just your goals, but also your why. Why am I doing this? Why is this important to me? Why is this going to be a priority? And really clearly state those. And it might take you a while to figure that out and fine tune it. It might be something you write down and you have to go back and add to later. I do encourage like write things down, like hand write. Take that because it, it forces you to slow down and kind of be a little more present. But along with, you know, have your goals at the top of a page and then follow through with those whys. Why am I doing this? Why is this important? Why is it a priority? Um, and keep that somewhere close by. Keep it in your truck. Keep it in your bed nightstand. But have it where you can see it because in those times where life is a little crazy and it would be just as easy to say, forget it, I'm not getting this done today, you can look at that and be like, you know what, I can do 15 minutes. 15 minutes of something, and you'll be amazed every single time. So it starts with the action of writing, and then it kind of goes into the action of even if I can't do everything, I can do something. And that keeps that motivation level higher than you think because it is that – it's like that that hit of dopamine, like that happiness of like, okay, but I, I did it. I did something, and that feels good. And you create the positive cycle. It's really easy for us to create that negative cycle of I'll do it tomorrow. I don't have time. I can't do this right now. And remind yourself, anytime you say, I don't have time, rephrase it. It's not a priority. Because in that moment, you might be like, well, son of a gun, this is a priority. So what, what little thing can I do? I know in today's day and age, there tends to be this like weird stigma of everything having to be like big, bold, badass, and grand. It's like all or nothing. And that's really such a terrible way of thinking when it comes to day-to-day -to -day tasks is something is always better than nothing. I mean, that's like saying, all right, I have 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I can go lunge my horse. I can go bit him up and lunge him real quick. I might not be able to get a big ride in. And you're probably going to go do that instead of just keeping your horse in their stall all day. So why wouldn't you do the same thing for yourself? Okay. I have 15 minutes. I can go for a walk. I can just go get some fresh air, walk, move my body, get the blood flowing, and you'll be amazed. Every single time you do that, it's going to add to your want to do more in a positive light instead of the negative guilt. I'm actually in the process of doing this personally with Kelly's help. And yeah, it, it's amazing how, you know, you can get bogged down with all this negativity and, oh, 
why bother Thanksgiving's next week or, oh, why bother? You know, the holidays are here. Um, but every little day counts. And, and even if you're not perfect on Thanksgiving because you're eating or you're traveling and you can't ride your horse or whatever, like the days before yes, it still matter. Absolutely. You can be three days ahead or three days behind. And again, it's that time frame of, are you staying caught up or are you setting yourself up to have to catch up? And catching up is always harder. Catching up, think of all the time you'd have to, all the time we do spend catching up could be time spent moving us forward. And it might only be in small increments, but a small increment forward is still forward motion. We're always looking for that forward progress. And, and it's reminding yourself that like, hey, that was enough for today. Um, something you and I have talked about and I talk about with all of my clients is creating non-negotiables. This is another really great thing, I think, through the holidays and even just all year long. But create non-negotiables and kind of like make a list of everything that you either have to do on a day-to-day basis or a list of upcoming things that you might have to be, you know, that you have to figure out, manage, and, and you know, negate. Ask yourself, is this something that I... I have to do today. Like this is a non, I have to do this. Otherwise there'll be a negative repercussion. You know, you have to feed your animals. You have to go to your job, uh, take care of your kids. Is this something that I really want to get done today? But if I wait a day or two, there will still be no negative repercussions. You know, I always use the example, my floors. I have two boys, four dogs. We live in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, surrounded by dirt and dust and high plains desert. I would love my floors to be clean every single day. I would. But it is not a non-negotiable. If it, if it goes, if I have dirt on my floor for one day, there will be no negative repercussion. It just, it'll be all right. So instead of telling myself, oh, I, I can't go ride and do this because I need to get all this stuff cleaned. And then I'm more miserable. And then I'm more angry at the end of the day and I'm less fulfilled. No one wins. No one wins that. We, we just defeated ourselves with that way of thinking. And I'm, I've been guilty of it. So creating these non-negotiables, this can wait a day. Nothing negative will happen if I wait one day. And then what are things that I'm putting on my plate that I really don't even have to do? I'm convinced, I, I've convinced myself I have to, but I technically don't have to. You know, my, my kids are getting older and I, don't get me wrong, like I love being there and helping them, but it's like, hey, my 15-year-old can do his laundry. He can do his own laundry. That is not something I've put it on me where I'm like, oh, but I like, no, I'll, I'm going to go ride my horse and you are going to go do your laundry. I am going to go get this workout in and you are going to go do these five chores. Like what are things we've put on our shoulders that we really could delegate? Because I think a lot of us can delegate more than we do. And it's not being selfish. It's creating a team with the people in your life and the things in your life that includes work and coworkers, just the same. What? what can I take off of my plate and then in place put in my health and wellness and well-being for myself, for my horse, and for my goals? So I think creating those non-negotiables can be really powerful and it kind of gives that power back to you. It, it really swaps our mindset to instead of I can't, I can't, I don't have time to how can I? Don't say I can't, say how can I? And then take, the, take those necessary steps to really look, take a big picture look at things. Yeah. I think that's really important too, because like you said, you can delegate. And I know personally, that's something that I need to get better about, um, in my personal life, my horse life, my work life, everything. Um, because I am definitely one of those that it's not going to get done right. (laughs) I'm just going to do it kind of people. And that has made, you know, a negative impact when, you know, I have to go to the barn and and now I'm tasked with cleaning this entire tack room. This is just an example, um, you know, and then instead of asking for help or being like, hey, why don't you get this part? I'll get this part. You know, you're yes. overwhelming yourself. And so I think that is really important to think about so that you do have that happy feeling when you walk into the barn or you walk into your workout or you walk into your house and your floors right, are exactly. dirty. Instead of being like, oh man, these dirty floors, you can be like, I got so many things done today that I'm really happy about. I feel good. I I will sweep these floors later tonight or in the morning and it's everything's going to be just fine. You said it really, you said it the best. We overwhelm ourselves. And more often than not, we overwhelm ourselves with the wrong things. Um, social media, the time we spend on our phone, 
you do not have to post every single day. You do not like, unless that is your job at a business, you do not have to, you can put the phone down and go live like in your actual real life with the actual real people who are part of it and the animals who are part of it and giving yourself that time, like that you're giving yourself that attention instead of giving it to other people on a phone. Like I I tell everyone, I want you to be selfish in the best ways possible. Selfish is always kind of given the negative connotation, but when you are doing it to improve your health, your strength, your quality of life, your mental well-being. It's not negative selfish. That's positive selfish because that's the stuff that flows into every other facet of your life and makes you better and more available for all other parts of your life. For sure. Uh, Well, and like the social media, that's actually something on my list that I'm working on with you is to not be on my phone as much because my job is content creation. I find myself on my phone, on my computer. I'm constantly trying to stay up to date with who's doing what and who's, you know, who's going where, who's selling this horse or buying this horse. Or, you know, I have to remind myself when I'm not at work to put away the phone because it is it's time consuming. It's overwhelming. And a lot of times I feel really bad about myself because all these people post the best parts of their life. They don't post actually what's going on in the background, but you see this person living their best horse life, doing all these epic trail rides and, you know, owning a five horses and a living quarters trailer and traveling all around the country. And, and, but you're, they're not showing the parts yeah. where we all they're not showing struggle. what took, what it took to get there. Like, I think there are more people than we realize who have had to overcome a lot of things, challenges. They've had to, you know, start from the bottom and you rarely hear that story. But I think in this industry, in this life, that happens more than any of us realize. And like you said, no one shows it. So instead of worrying about that highlight reel you see, I think it's really fulfilling and self-satisfying once you get in the habit to kind of focus on like the highlight reel of your life. Like, how can I make today my highlight? How can I make today something I'm excited about for me? Whether you share it or not is your choice in your business. But I really think when we step away from, you know, worrying about what everyone else is doing, not even worrying, but concerning ourselves with what everyone else is doing, whether it matters to us or not. Like, what are you doing today? Like, what am I going to do? You know, it really changed that narrative again. And it's not disassociating from other people, but it's putting yourself front and center in your life. Like, what what great thing. I'm going to go do this workout and I'm going to be really proud of myself when I'm done with it because I'm going to feel good. I'm going to feel strong. I'm going to feel more badass. And then I'm going to go have this great ride on my horse because I have this horse that, yes, might not be as fancy as some other ones, but I am capable of making it better because I'm putting the time in. And I, I think we've kind of been conditioned a little to feel guilty or like conceited when we focus on us, but it has nothing to do with that. Like, Focusing on living your best life and being your best person and the best rider and the best horse owner isn't selfish or conceited. It's just living in your life and in your moment and in your present, which is something we could all benefit from doing more and more and more of. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Supplements are only effective if your horse eats them. AccuBites, a new line of supplement blends brought to you by ManaPro, takes the guesswork out of supplementation. Each formula is designed for palatability and has a unique shape and color that stands out when top dressed on a feed, so you can immediately confirm your horse's intake. Every blend includes a convenient, carefully balanced combination of ingredients that is proven to support specific needs for your horse. Finally, a supplement you can see and believe. Find out more at manapro.com. 100%. Um, So for those people who are, you know, sitting at home and trying to get through these winter months and, you know, working out outside is not always an option for a lot of people. Um, you know, us very included because sometimes it's negative 15 out. I know I have a, a, a garage gym, so I have to get creative when it's below freezing and I don't want to work out outside. Um, but you know, we find a lot of people getting overwhelmed going back to what we were talking about mentally overwhelmed with the thought of 
working out in the winter, maybe because it's too cold. They live in the a rural part of the country and they can't get to a gym. What is your advice for um, fitness, staying in shape for riding uh, at home? Like, because yes. obviously yes. it is doable, right? Like, you know, you, you don't have to have a squat rack and, a, a you know, a, a bench yes. press, you know, all these things while they yeah. are helpful. And if you are very serious about working out is obviously something that you might look into having, but there's a lot you can do. Yes. With oh my gosh. Small stuff. It is, it is so doable to do home workouts and something I, I used to preach a lot of, and I need to get back to reminding everyone. It is insane. The changes you can make just doing body weight work. And the secret to that change, excuse me, is consistency. It's again, stepping away from that, like bigger is better. I have to have all the stuff and all the equipment and the gym and the, don't worry about that. Worry about every day, consistency every day. Something as simple as body weight squats, um, working on pushups, planks and plank variations. I actually have uh, quite a few new exercises and lifts that are really at the end of the day, all body weight and they're unconventional, but they're all body weight. They require no equipment. They just require you that are some of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Like I, to this day, am still working on perfecting them when I share those videos with my clients because they are so challenging. And who would have thought just moving your own damn body could be so challenging, but they they are addressing a lot of very small imbalances and small weaknesses versus just focusing on the big. And they have made me tenfold stronger. So I am now programming those into my clients' workouts. But it's amazing what you can do with body weight, even resistance bands. They go a long ways by, you know, Facebook marketplace, pl places like that. You'd be amazed what just a few sets of dumbbells can even do if, if you even need that added resistance. But you can literally change your entire life. You can change your entire body composition. And you can change your capabilities as a rider just doing body weight work consistently. There are great uh, resources online. I'm actually in the process of putting together um, a, a membership space for people who maybe aren't quite ready for full immersion one-on-one -on -one coaching, but they want some more tools and resources to provide this full exercise library that Yes, it'll have some gym lifts and workouts, but it's going to have a lot of this unconventional body weight work for people to have access to. And it'll have videos so you can ensure you're doing it correctly. But there are so many resources out there. Yoga videos are online. That's Yoga is priceless for riders. Like you cannot, it is so helpful to keep our bodies nourished and mobile and moving well. And I think a lot of times we think like, oh, that's not enough. It goes a long ways, especially in the saddle. There are so many tightnesses and um, that, that yoga can help open up and then, again, allows our bodies and our muscles to fire better because we are kind of stuck in that immobility. But go online, use those resources. You know, I hope to have mine up by January 1st and, and fully functioning, I think, is probably the biggest scare in that situation, <laughs> technology. But it's finding stuff that works well for you, that feels good for your body, and then doing it consistently. 20 minutes, five days a week, you can change your whole body just doing body weight exercises without question. Yeah. And it's like you said, 20 minutes, it's all that it takes. And I have to remind myself of that too, because sometimes I get so overwhelmed and I'm like, oh, I, I have to choose between working out and riding my horse. When in reality, I could probably be like, you know what, I can just spend mm -hmm. 15 minutes doing some squats, some lunges, you know, maybe a couple of ab yep. exercises right here on my living room yep. floor, and then still get out to the barn in time. It's just kind of, yes. that, and that's, goes back that's to the where thing, I had to mindset. bring a little more mindset coaching into the coaching I provide, because that really is the biggest inhibitor. I'm going to tell you what, almost all of us like have the time to some degree. We have the capability to some degree. It is getting out of our heads and into our bodies and convincing ourselves, nope, I can do this. Like, ex like I said earlier, not, not focusing on the I can't, but the how can I? How can I do this? And just like you said, for 15 minutes, I can do some of these lower body exercises, some ab work, and then go, go ride. You know, it doesn't have to be an hour and a half, two hour crazy lift in a gym 
45 minutes away from where you live. It's making everything work for you and, and deciding why that's important to you. Well, and kind of, I, I just kind of was thinking about this and I was like, you know what? It's even more necessary to do something like that because you're kind of warming your body up to go ride anyway. Absolutely. Some of the greatest things you can do, especially before you ride, body weight squats are runners use body weight squats because it helps set your hips evenly. And so I provide obviously pre and post ride stretches for my clients, but some of those are like doing single leg chair, really opening up your, your extensors, like the back of your glutes and doing things like some lunges and some body weight squats just to get the blood flowing to those muscles do pigeon pose, open your hips up, and then in pigeon pose, lean forward, keeping your back nice and neutral and as flat as possible to open up the back side of things. Lie on your back and bring your knee to your chest, bring your leg over your body, leg up in the air straight, and stretch all of those muscles out. So when you get in the saddle, you're not trying to work out the kinks and have a cold body do that work. You're primed. I mean, you warm our horses up, right? We warm our horses up. Why are we not warming up? Same. I mean, for sure. And so, and then even post ride, people get like a tight back or achy knees. Uh, another great ex- pre ride stretch is just a standing quad stretch. If your knees hurt when you ride at any point, chances are your quads are tight and most likely your hip flexors. So, if you can stand nice and tall, keep your knees together and stretch those quads out, just grab your ankle. If you're unable to grab your ankle, you can put your foot on like a elevated surface to some degree behind you and kind of stretch down to allow that quad or sink down to allow that quad to stretch out. Um, for pigeon pose, if getting down and up off the ground is difficult, you can do it kind of like on a fence line or a gate even, um, or, a, a, and stretch through that, that front hip flexor. But there are so many things we can do to prep our body to avoid the aches and pains. And then, you know, post ride, same, do that. It's like the sciatic nerve stretch, knee to chest, knees or legs straight in the air, like over the side of our body and stretch out a little bit, five, 10 minutes. You know, I think get it stuck in our head. We don't have time because we think it's going to take forever. Five, 10 minutes. And then, you know, you can enjoy the rest of your day without the, the tight back and the achy knees. Well, and like you said, you warm up your horse. Why wouldn't you warm up right. yourself? And then right. you cool down your horse. So why wouldn't you cool down <laughs> right. yourself? It's a simple concept. And I think it's like we put ourselves last, right? And I get it. I totally get it. Been there, done that. But when you start doing it and then you reap the benefits and you feel good, you're like, why? like you said, why wasn't I doing this sooner? Like why? This is insane because you just feel that good. You know, it's it's the little things. The magic is in the little monotonous things that we overlook that really skyrocket our success forward. Absolutely. Uh, So we've talked a lot about how nutrition and fitness is really great for the performance world. You know, you're, you're only going to get better, but it's also really important for the casual rider or the trail rider or somebody that only rides once a month. So you have a very large experience, both in the show pen and out of the show pen. Uh, I think on the last podcast, we kind of went into detail, but your husband was an outfitter and you guys do a lot of uh, hunting in the mountains, overnight camping trips. So you spend a lot of time outside of the arena in the saddle and obviously have the experience to talk about how important it is to also stay fit for trail riding. Yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh. When it comes to our trail riding, like you think of all the obstacles that you ride over and through and under and around, and those rides tend to be longer. You know, it's not the hour, two hours in the saddle, it's days in the saddle. And then, like you said, in the you know instances of camping or the overnight trips, you're probably sleeping with a, I mean, I've done it everywhere from where we have, cause we have pack horses, you know, nice cots and thermo rests and the great sleeping bags, but I've also done it where I'm sleeping on a saddle pad, you know, and that's on the ground. And the older you get, sometimes that get, gets tough. But when you are fueling your body for all of that, the fuel is really important and making sure you have adequate protein. There are so many great, like very easy on the go grabs, beef jerky, the freeze-dried meals. Um, Starkist has like the chicken salad and tuna, uh, pre-flavored tuna packets. Uh, You can even just cook up meat ahead of time to have in baggies, as weird as that sounds. Um, String cheese, you know, there are protein bars all out there to make sure you have adequate protein while you're on the trail or whether you're on your, you know, doing like a backcountry trip. 
because protein helps our muscles recover. I think a lot of people are under the impression that protein is what builds muscles. Protein is what recovers our muscles. It helps. So that's going to help reduce soreness. And especially on those like two, three, four, five day trips, reducing any muscle soreness just from hours upon hours in the saddle is huge. And ensuring you're getting enough protein is going to be a big part of that. Stash your saddlebags, stash your pack, your pack horse, whatever it may be, and and make sure throughout the day you are continuously having protein every time you sit to eat. And then another big deal, especially trail riding and, and out on those like, you know, overnight trips is ensuring you do have enough fats and carbs for performance. You want to stay fueled. You know, you go all day without eating and, and we're all guilty of it. It's just kind of survival mode, but you hit a wall, you bonk, and you have no energy left. And the last place you want to do that is out in the woods, out in the mountains. You want to stay fueled. So again, there's so many great options Trail Mix, um, Stinger, the company Stinger makes these little honey waffles that are great, easy, fast carbs, apples, um, gosh, you name it. I mean, there's so many packable things when it comes to fats and and carbs, but you want to stay fueled. So not only are you physically keeping your body well, you know, well able to perform just as much for your mind. You want to have a clear mind. You don't want to have the hunger fog when you are, you know, at 10,000 feet back in the wilderness, that's the worst place to have, you know, hunger fog. So you want to make sure you have a clear mind and a strong body to get in and out safely, to ride well and keep up with your horse, uh, and then also to recover. So you can wake up each morning ready to go and feeling good. Well, and that's so the, and fueling your body was something that I wanted to bring up next. So I'm really glad that you touched on that already is because whether you're showing or trail riding, that seems to be something that a lot of people forget about. You know, we are so busy focused on our horses and, and everything else that we're doing that eating is kind of the last thing that, and I'm guilty of it too. You know, like, um, I'm totally guilty of knowing what I should be eating, but then I'm going, um, I'm in a rush. I'll just eat later or whatever, but let's, let's talk a little bit about fueling your body. And, um, you mentioned, you know, protein intake, carbs, fats, you know, I think diet culture without getting too preachy in in that subject, because this is a horse podcast, but you know, that's really affected the way that we look at food as a society. Um, and I think it's really important to have somebody that says, Hey, you know, we don't need all these diets. You just need to know what you're eating. Yes. And that's, I'm, I'm really happy you touched on that and I'll, I'll try and keep it as, um, I won't get preachy, (laughs) but diet, you know, diet implies restriction. Like when people hear the word diet, there's rarely a diet is technically a specific way of eating or a certain way of eating, but that is not how we think of it. When we hear it, we think of restriction. We think of being hunger, you know, reducing intake. And that's kind of like this constant. And you have to think like your body, sure, if you would like to lose some body fat, yes, we can adjust our intake strategy to meet that. But we need to remember to fuel for performance. We need to fuel our bodies and feed our muscles. You can't expect your muscles, your body, your brain to keep up with everything you want it to do without giving it nourishment. And Carbs have obviously been demonized, and it, 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 every single macronutrient so proteins, fats, and carbs, and water are our macronutrients, our must haves for our bodies to function. They all serve very specific functions in our body. Carbs, which I think are demonized the most, are our, pri- our body's primary source of fuel for our brain, our nervous system, and our eyesight. Demonizing them makes no sense severely reducing or eliminating them makes no sense. Our bodies need them for these specific functions. So I I tell everyone I work with, like, we don't need to take away any one macronutrient. We might need to pay attention to how specific foods that fall under that macronutrient category make us feel. If you have a gluten intolerance or celiacs, yes, you are going to avoid carbs with gluten, all foods with gluten. But that doesn't mean you can't eat carbs. You just have to choose the right ones. Now, I tell everyone, and this is something I just, I really feel strongly about, the only foods you have to avoid to reach your goals 
are foods you're allergic to, foods you absolutely dislike, and foods that are rotten. Otherwise, we don't have to remove or eliminate any one food. There is not one single food that is inherently good or inherently bad. One single food will not make us reach our goals, and one single food will not destroy us from reaching those goals if we're paying attention to our overall intake. And that is for growing muscle, losing body fat, getting stronger, performing better, improving endurance. There is not one single food that is going to save you or hurt you. You just have to listen to your body. It's always talking. If you eat pizza and it makes you bloated and miserable and gassy and just unhappy, it doesn't mean that you can never have it. It just means let's kind of cut back on it because your body is telling you it doesn't fit well. Some people don't have a single problem with it. Then awesome. You can make it work for you. But it's not the food that's our enemy. It's the way we think about food. That's kind of the enemy. We need to look at it as fuel. Food is fueling us and how does it work for us? And if this food isn't working for me and it makes me feel bad, you're an adult. You don't have to eat it if it makes you feel bad. (laughs) Well, and I think it's so interesting because like when it comes to my horse's nutrition, I am like, okay, she needs this. She needs this. She needs this. She needs this, you know, and then I don't look at it for me. And I'm like, wait, if I'm making my horse make sure that she has proper protein, you know, crude protein and and the carbs and the (laughs) fats and the, you know, omegas and this and that, like, why am I, why am I not focusing it on for me too? Like, and, and it really opened my eyes both uh, in the horse industry when it comes to my horse's nutrition and learning more about the ingredients your horse should be eating. Um, but, it, you know, it, it opened my eyes for what I was eating, but then also how it affects my horse too, because now I'm sitting here going like, what else don't I know about food? <laughs> and I, I think that's so many of these diets, quote unquote, they don't teach you about food. They just tell you what you can and can't have. And I guess my thing is like, I'm not your mom. I might be a nutritionist and your nutrition coach, but I'm not your mom. I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't eat. When you're given a meal plan, you don't learn anything. You just do what you're told to do, but you don't learn why. You don't learn. You might hate it, but you're doing it and you're getting these results, but you hate it. So eventually you're going to say, screw this. And then you're going to revert or go hog wild the opposite direction and then lose all that ground So why not be successful and take the time it takes eating the foods you like, you know? Yes. If you're, if you're eating better whole foods, you're going to have a little better progress or faster progress. But that doesn't mean that you can't have, I tell everyone, I love Sour Patch Kids and nachos. Like those are my, there was one day I was pretty low on carbs and I needed to catch back up. And so I got done with my workout and I was like, I'm going to get some Sour Patch Kids because even though they're just straight sugar, it's a carb. I don't do it every day. But it's something that still can be done. And we get in this negative mindset, this negative connotation towards everything. Again, how can it work for me? Maybe not every day, but in this moment, how can it work for me? And enjoy food. You know, it shouldn't be this miserable, stressful, overwhelming thing. But diets make it that way because they don't teach anything. You just do what you're told. So my goal for all my clients is that they learn, like, these foods are primarily carbs. These are primarily protein. These are primarily fats. These are combinations. Which ones do you like and how can we make them work for you? You know, and I think like at horse shows, this is a great example is you, especially you talking about your horse. I'm doing this for my horse. Why not for me? We go to the concession stand and basically eat a giant fat bomb, like a greasy fat bomb. Now, fats totally work for you just the same. But they do slow your digestion a little bit more than any of the other macros. And let's be honest, the fat bombs at the concession stand are like five times the amount of fats any of us really even need. So then we wonder why we're sluggish and hitting that mid-afternoon like just wall. And you're supposed to go warm your horse up, but you feel like crap, but your horse feels amazing because you care so much about what they're getting, but you don't. So now they're like, oh, you're just going to kind of sit up there like, a you know, bump on a log. Okay. Like we're just doing that today. So it's, it's really just setting yourself up for success through fueling. Pack some extra things, have them on hand, go enjoy the burger, but like have some other stuff you might need. I've, I've been guilty of doing that. And then, yeah, like I started working with you and, and you were like, it's easy to pack snacks. Why aren't you packing this? And it's just a matter of your mindset. When you travel with your horse, you pack everything for them, everything. 
why aren't we doing it for us? Pack everything for you too. Yeah. And like you said, pack your cooler, pack it with hard boiled eggs and carrots and veggies and chicken. And you know, like why? And, and I sat there and I was like, wait, why don't I do that? And you know, I it, it, like light bulb went off and now all of a sudden, um, you know, I used to be tired by two o'clock in the afternoon and now I'm like cooking through and, you know, getting on another horse and I'm like, man, I feel great. Like this is awesome. And then I will get lazy one day and go back to eating the concession stand food. And I'm like, this is why I don't do this. Like, Yeah. Right. Right. And, and it, at least like by packing, you at least have the option. The option is there. Hey, maybe, maybe you go eat the fries, but not the greasy burger or vice versa because you have some other stuff you can mix with it and eat, but like give yourself the options to make those decisions in the moment. And you like, just like you said, you know, you go back to the concession stand the one day and they're like, wow, I feel like garbage. This is why I don't do it. It, at least it allows you to like learn in those moments. Like, okay, yep. I don't feel good anymore, but now I have this cooler full of food. I'm going to go back to this for the, you know, rest of the duration of this show and feel good. But Set yourself up for that success to, to make those decisions as needed. So we've talked about at-home workouts. We've talked about making sure that you're fueling your body. Um, but before I let you go, I wanted to talk a little bit about exercises that you can do in the saddle during the winter months. Because again, going back to the small arenas or maybe no arena Ooh, or I love that. You know, whatever it might be you might not be able to do what you want to do with your horse to an extensive kind of way, but there's still things that you can do in the saddle to build your strength. So I love this question. I'm going to start with over the years, you know, you hear people talk about core, 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 core. And what is missing from core is entire trunk and trunk stability. Everyone, when you think of when most people hear the word core, they think of abdominals and that's it. They think of your abs. Core truly involves our entire corset. So I've really changed the, um, I guess the dialogue and the, and the words I use in my coaching and cueing. We need to start thinking about our corset. So think of how you ask your horse to lift their lungs, right? Like you're asking them to kind of drive from the hind end and lift their lungs up for you. We need to do the same thing in the saddle. So by being really mindful and conscious, I want people to think of cinching their corset. So you know, like how when you tighten the cinch on your saddle, why saddle, a good saddle fit is important is because you are pulling that down around their withers as well. That is tightening, not just from bottom up, the entire saddle is tightening around their heart girth. So think of like, you know, like the old school corset, someone pulling that corset tight. It's not just pulling your tummy in. It is bringing those erector muscles along either side of your spine up and in and engaging them. So we're going to use our abdominals up front, our obliques on the side, and our erector muscles up the back. We are cinching our corset. And when we cinch our corset, we naturally lift our lungs. That one sets you up for better posture in the saddle, but it also, excuse me, just gives you more strength as a whole. So we're going to cinch our corset, lift our lungs through our collarbone, up to our crown, which is the top of your head, and then imagine your crown kind of being pushed down. So it gives you this power posture in the saddle. I encourage people to do it out of the saddle. If you go for daily walks, focus on that power posture, cinch the corset, lift the lungs, through the collarbone, crown down. And that's something you can do at all speeds. Start at the walk, because you probably will get sore from it. If you're really engaging those muscles and doing it for an extended amount of time, start at the walk and do that. And then bump up to the jog and the lope and see how long you can hold that power posture. And you are going to gain really good trunk stability. It is, it is going to happen. It is impossible not to if you are doing that work. And then another thing that I think is really great to do is extend your horse like through the post. Post well, but post consciously. I don't know about you. I think we're all guilty of it. Where you just kind of like post your horse. And you're just going because you can and you know how. But think of the muscles you're using, mind on the muscles in motion and engage them as you rise and fall with that outside leg. And really think about, again, like as you're rising up, engage that power posture, sit back down. So now your legs are working, your glutes are working into your low back and through your trunk. 
And that alone will really bring together that entire chain of muscles that you need to use at all speeds. But that's something that doesn't require a lot of space. You can just go around the outside, but consciously focus on those muscles, mind on the muscles in motion and go from posting to then sitting and posting. You can even kind of, you know, long trot them out and then bring them back down to you. That's going to help you also with just your body control. And so once you get back to maybe your bigger arena, more speeds, fencing, line drill, whatever it may be, you're kind of already set up for that success. Your body control is fine-tuned versus kind of just hanging in there. Before I let you go, it's November. This podcast is coming out at the end of November, but it is No Stir Up November. No Stir Up November. Always drop those stirrups. Yes. Always drop those stirrups. Drop those stirrups and see how you can rate your horse and increase and decrease speed without using your stirrups for balance. I think we forget how much we let them babysit us until they're gone. Get rid of them. Work on that posting without stirrups if you're able, really driving your horse out to lengthen and then bringing them back down to you. Because if you can do that without your stirrups, once you get those bad boys back, you are gold. Well, and I know that being the having the ability to ride without stirrups has saved me a couple times when I lose my stirrup, but I can yeah. still keep doing <laughs> yes. what I need to do until I can get it back. Absolutely. I love that's a very good point. Yes. And I think we've all we've all been in there that moment as well. Sure. I actually my my best lo- lose a stirrup story. I was riding for this old horseman. He passed away 2 years ago at 98, still riding three horses a day. Um and he, uh, I was, he let me, I was down there. He let me ride like his baby, his, that horse was his girl. And I was loping a small circle and I lost my outside stirrup and I thought I could get it back before. And he had, he yelled at me before I could even like, he could see the change in my body position from just losing that stirrup. And I was like, son of a gun. I thought I had him fooled, but no such luck. So by removing, like you said, those stirrups and going through all of that, it, hel- it sets you up for everything else moving forward. It, it helps keep that posture strong and steady. hundred um, percent. So, okay. Well, yeah, I, I've kept you for an hour now. Um, <laughs> before I let you go, though, do you want to let people know where they can learn more about you? You post on social media a lot and not just... Um, yes. not, not just stuff for your clients, but just for the general public when it comes to education on fitness, nutrition, especially horse-based, um, fitness and, and all of that for the rider. So can you let people know where they can follow you and, and learn more about some of the cool stuff that you're putting out? Yes, absolutely. So I think my Instagram is probably the most, um, utilized. It is at Western underscore workouts. I post about nutrition tips. I post in saddle, out of saddle exercises, um, addressing just different issues. Like I think my most recent, I'm working on a series of sitting versus surviving the stop and things you can do in and out of the saddle to improve that. I do have a website, westernworkouts.com. And then I also have a Facebook, uh, Western, I think it's just Western Workouts. Uh, You can always email me or message me with questions at any time. I try and do my best at even just answering kind of everyday general questions here and there, even if you're not totally ready for coaching. If you are interested in more coaching information, you can go to my website, scroll all the way to the bottom, and then input your email address um, in that area. And within 24 hours, you'll have an email back with the complete rundown of my coaching, what it entails, what it requires, pricing, all of that good stuff. Yeah. And, and like you had mentioned earlier, you're working on a website with video content. Um, but yes. until that comes out, Horse and Rider On Demand actually did a video series with you. Uh, and and yes. while you will probably be going into more depth with yours, I think people could probably get a really good general idea of some of the stuff that you like rough riders to work on when it comes to fitness. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, the horse and rider on demand is very thorough. 
there's so much information there in terms of just even single exercises, like this is how you do this correctly, all the way to putting these certain exercises together to get the most benefit. But yes, absolutely go to Horse and Rider On Demand as well. And hopefully we'll be creating some more videos. Yeah, there. absolutely. I think we spent maybe 20 hours, a couple of days putting these videos together. And <laughs> it was like in the heart of COVID, which I was, I think was really great because so many people were doing that at home workouts or, or trying yes. to find ways to stay busy. Um, and yeah, no, I loved it. And I think it's a really good intro course to what you can be doing to help your Absolutely. riding. So yeah, if you haven't, Absolutely. if you haven't checked that out, go to ondemand.horseandrider.com and uh, sign up for the free trial. Check out yeah, Kelly's stuff. Let's do it. <laughs> so. Awesome. Her, well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Today. Thank you for coming back and maybe we'll find another interesting topic and, and bring you back in a couple oh, yeah. months and, and <laughs> love that. see what else we can tell people about fitness and riding and, and being the best rider that you can be. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, we'd like to thank Manapro for being the sponsor of this week's episode. Thank you guys for tuning into the Ride Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow Horse and Rider Magazine on social media and find us at horseandrider.com to see all the cool things that we're up to. And if you have any comments or questions, please be sure to hit us up at horseandrider at equinenetwork.com. We want to hear from you guys. And if you like what you're listening to, please be sure to leave us a review on iTunes. 